So it's not a finished research. It's not a research on but this is something, this is idea that we had. And uh, it looks very, very promising. We, we tried. And, uh, but unfortunately, it would take quite a lot of time to go to, to do something uh, usable out of it. And we don't really have the time to elaborate it. On the other hand, this is a good research topic. So if there is someone who is, who is looking for an interesting topic to do research on and, and publish about and do something which is useful at the same time, then I think that's that's an in quite a quite good topic because like everybody would love to, their simulations to run quite a few times faster than currently on common hardware, so on their own laptops or desktops. So, so after reading the title, anybody would have like two questions. Like first, what is this zero config parallel simulation? And uh, anyway, doesn't OMET have parallel simulation support already? So. Um, yeah, let's begin with the second one. Yes, OMNET does have parallel simulation support, and uh, it's based on the logical process this approach, conservative simulation. So if you have a network like, like this one, a number of routers connected with um, <coughs> lines, then uh, first you would have to partition it. So, Partition, in this, in this case, I partition it to five logical processes. And these logical processes would run on separate processors, uh, perhaps on separate computers also. And uh, this means that all the, all the links that go across these partition lines, uh, they, will be, they will have to be implemented using uh, communication between those processes. And okay, but uh, how does should one do this partitioning? There are a few rules, like interactions between partitions should be minimal. So, um, so most of the events should cause only effect within their own partition. And uh, basically, this means that the link, the traffic on those links which go across partitions should be quite minimal, and the link delays on the link delays on those partitions should be quite high and we go in, we will see later why. And the workload should be evenly distributed because otherwise some processor will not be uh, fully utilized. So if the partition is done, then uh, you have to describe it to OMNET, which is uh, in, in omnetpp.ini, this, this partition ID uh, configuration options. This can be quite lengthy if you have a lot of routers or the modules. And then you run the simulation on multiple processes. And in this case, we have five logical processes, so there will be five processes. And these, the lines here in, in the graph, they show the communication path, actually. And uh, in real life, this will execute over MPI, message passing interface library. And what do you use it for? Basically, you need a multi-core laptop or desktop computer, or preferably if you have more than a few logical processes, you need a high, uh, high performance computing cluster, which means the between the nodes, the low latency should be very low. And this is even more important than bandwidth. And of course, nowadays you have lots of options like where to run these simulations. You can run it on your own laptop or computer, or you can easily access like a uh, supercomputer center or use commercial services where uh, such uh, such clusters are easily available. So, of course, because the simulation is now divided up to logical processes, we have quite a lot of limitation. So you can't use lo global variables because those lo variables are really only local to the to that partition. You can't access modules across part in, in other partitions. You cannot make method calls across the partition boundaries and so on. And there is also overhead. There's communication overhead clearly, which means that if you send a packet from one router to another and the other router is in, in another partition, that the message will have to be serialized and sent over to the other one, to the to the other processor using some IPC mechanism or some kind of protocol. And there's also synchronization overhead, which means um, we have to keep the, the simulation, the simulated time somehow coordinated um, in order to prevent bad things from happening. And we'll see it in the next slide. So what happens if there is no synchronization? 
solution. That's because we have two logical processes, the upper one and the lower one, and this, this arrow symbolizes time, and the green symbolizes the already simulated uh, simulation time. Of course, all the other processes have their own logical, time, logical times. And so when the, the top process sends a message to the one in the bottom, it will end up, and the, the, other, the other process, the other logical process is too far away, too far ahead in the future, then it will receive a message in its past. And this is something that's not supposed to happen in, in simulation. So this is a causality violation. The simulation has simulation will stop on an, with an error, which means that uh, all these these logical processes will have to be will have to execute reasonably together, reasonably in lockstep. And this uh, maximum amount of delta that they can differ from each other is called the look ahead. In a, this is a somewhat sloppy definition, but it's for our purposes now, it's good enough. So basically, yeah, the future should not affect the past. So this is this is the main problem, the central problem of parallel discrete event simulation. So if we have a, an event, it should not have an effect on, on other events with smaller time spans because otherwise we have time travel problems. Uh, in general, just a small outlook. In general, there are two parallel discrete event simulation approaches in the literature. One is conservative, the other one is optimistic. And conservative means that uh, causality violation should never occur. So we only do, only execute events which are safe to execute. And um, there's an example, this new message protocol, which Omnet also implements. And um, the other one, uh, other approach is uh, speculative execution basically so we the processors can run forward and if something bad happens this is detected and it's repaired by rolling back so the simulator like uh the sim so that the pro the affected process will uh restore its previous state and re-execute it and this time taking care that that thing doesn't happen again so of course both approaches have different advantages and drawbacks. Conservative is obviously um, uh, easier to implement because in, in optimistic, this going forward, going backward thing makes the algorithm very, very complicated. You have to send it. If you, and uh, the other thing is that, um, which is which makes it very complicated is the state saving and restoration because the simulation in C++, the simulation cannot do it for yourself. In each and every module, you have to do it. So if you have an OSPF model, for example, then, then from time to time, you will have to back up all the routing tables and all the data structures, because if there is a rollback, you have to restore them. So a lot of, so all the simulation models became a lot more complicated with, with optimistic. And moreover, if conservative, so if conservative provides a good enough speed up, then there's really no need for optimistic. Yeah, so this was, so the original approach, original parallel simulation on that is based on the logical processes approach. And um, we want to diverge from this, why? Because advances in hardware. So uh, in the recent years, the single core performance is no longer increasing significantly. Instead, we have increasing number of processor cores, which means that nowadays you can buy a desktop computer, which is, has the equivalent or very similar uh, functionality or, or, or power than a, a high performance computing cluster had before. So basically, in these terms, like everybody can have a supercomputer on his desk. And then the other thing is memory abounds. So we can easily have like 64 gigabytes of memory. And earlier there was a, an argument for this even simplistic or logical process approach to that you can distribute the memory requirements because every process only has to keep one part of the memory, one part of the model in memory. And this no longer applies because you can buy as much memory as you want. So it's, it doesn't make sense to, uh, to do this. The other thing is the limitations of this approach. So one is this coding limitation you've seen that you can't really access modules across 
yeah, in the other partitions, there's overhead, communication overhead, serialization overhead. And because of this message passing thing, we can't fully take advantage of the shared memory systems that the multi-core computers are nowadays. And there's inconvenience. We have to do MPI run and manage multiple processes and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it's, it's inconvenient. So why? So what, what can we do instead? So uh, basic idea is this. So if, uh, if you just remember one slide for presentation, it should be this slide. Uh, we want to do the simulation as a simple multi-threaded program, like any other multi-threaded program, and share everything in the memory. We share also the, the set of future events. And we have uh, uh, a number of worker threads which take events from the future, future event set and process them. And then the resulting events, it could go back to the future events and so on. But of course, there is a reason why this is not done already. And this is very serious reasons. One, one reason is that the event causality must be kept. So the events cannot be processed in arbitrary order. You have to obey uh, um, the, the causality constraints. So uh, you can't process an event if it's going to have a, uh, an effect on, a, on an event, on an earlier event. And the other thing is concurrent. Other thing is concurrent data access. Sorry, I'm here. The other thing is that uh, now all data structures are accessed in the simulation are accessed concurrently, which means they have to be protected, like mutual exclusion and locks and stuff like that. So first we tackle the causality problem. So let's do a thought experiment. Let's suppose that we have a star crossing the Centauri. It's, it's a 4.38 light, light years away. So what happens if that star would explode now? Would we see it? No, of course, we would only see it in, in four, four, some, four and something years. So what if it exploded like four years ago? Then we still would not see it. We would see it in a very near future. But the thing is that uh, simultaneous events will not affect each other. So if there's a time difference, there is a, a distance of 4.37 uh, light years, then the events so if the, the time difference between two events is less than 4.37 year, then these events cannot affect each other. And uh, physics is a very good way of visualizing this, which is a space-time diagram. So on the horizontal axis, you have space. On the vertical axis, you have time. And then approximately, approximately 45 degrees angle, which is 60 degrees angle on this slide you have the speed of light. And basically, which means that anything which is inside that cone can see, uh, can be affected by this event, by event A, and anything which is out cannot. So for example, event A can affect event B, but event C is completely independent. There's no way they can affect each other. Um, so based on this, um, we can we can introduce a coloring. So if you we can color the uh, those events which are completely independent of each other, we cannot influence each other. Then we can color them them green, and the other events we can color red. And uh, if the time progresses, which means this horizontal axis will move up, then the events which have have been which have passed will like fall out of of this chart, and uh, red events will will become the bottom red events will become green, and the, as as the axis move progresses more and more upwards, the more and more red events will turn green. And you can also see that green, green events will stay green all the time because there's nothing that could affect them. <clears throat> so if we apply this um, 
the thing to, to simulation that we can look at two modules and if there's only a message passing between them, it means you can you can take it like if you have two modules which, which have a hundred millisecond delay between them, you can look at it like they would have a, a distance of 100 light milliseconds. And uh, if we have multiple modules with multiple paths, then of course the distance of two modules can be uh, is, is the shortest path regarding delay. So just relate. So now we have a distance notion, and we can basically apply it to 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 this chart. So how do we do the simulation? So the meaning of coloring is that if we have some green events, all these green events can be executed concurrently. And red events cannot be executed concurrently. They can be executed like one at a time if there are red events. And during simulation, the work of threads process green events. They are free to choose any green event because it's independent of all the others. And there has to be something uh, another process, a color process, which, which continually works on turning more events to green. So how would this look in hardware? It means that you would have, uh, if you have like a, on the top top image, you have a four core processor, like three cores can, can run worker threads, which process events, and one core would be dedicated to running the coloring algorithm. And um, if the coloring algorithm becomes a bottleneck, then it is possible to design a coloring algorithm which is which works in itself in parallel. And then you can have um, like in a six core configuration, you can have like as eight core configuration, you can have six cores working on, on, on processing simulation events and two cores working on coloring. So what, what, what is this coloring algorithm? Basically, it's, it's kind of simple. It does one thing all the time continually. And this is the following. For each red event in the future event set, if it's not in any, others, any other events light cone, then mark it as green. Just remember the, uh, the time space diagram I've shown. If it's not in any other events light cone, it can be marked as green. And of course, we can uh, write it a little bit more formally, formulating the arrival times, the events, and the distance, and blah, blah, blah. But basically, this means that uh, we calculate the t as the time of the earliest possible effect from any other module. And if the event is supposed to arrive earlier than uh, any influence from other modules, then it's independent of all the other events. Right? So how can we compute these distance functions? Because it's quite uh, quite uh, central. So of course, if the topology is static, we can pre-compute it. And if the topology changes at runtime, we can keep it up to date. And um, of course, we may store it as a matrix. But if we have a lot of, lot of modules, then this matrix may become very big. But there is an obvious optimization possibility that uh, if there are zero delay module groups, then they can be collapsed into one entry. And this reduces the number of rows and columns in the matrix. So for example, in INET, almost all the, the modules, these protocol modules, are connected with zero delay links, zero delay connection, which means that basically nearly all modules within a host or a rotor in INET, they, they form such a zero delay group. And this like greatly reduces the matrix size to, to a fraction. Okay, and uh, of course, not not all the um, not all the effects are by message passing. There are other other uh, dependencies across modules. So, for example, the obvious one is like a method call. So, if a module A calls a function in module B, that's that's an obvious dependence. We have to take this into account. So for example, if the module A calls a setter function in module B, that's basically like sending a zero delay message 
uh, with the command set this variable to value x. And this means that the distance of A to B is zero. Or if there's a gap, it means that the B module, it's like the B module sending the information back to A. So the, 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 it's, a, it's a dependency in the other direction. So distance B A equals zero. And if, so if, there's, if, if the function does both kind of things, then it's mutual dependence. Of course, there's global variables. They have instantaneous effect as well. So if there's a global variable which is written by module A and read by module B, then it's an A to B dependence. It's like a setter function. And there is also signals, simulation signals. Simulation signals actually they are method calls just in disguise because if you call an, if you emit a signal, it propagates like to other parts of the networks and it invokes the listener listener functions indirectly. So the emit call like indirectly invokes the listeners. So it, it also means that there is a dependency from all modules which contain the uh, the emit call to the modules which contain the, the listeners. So this is also like zero de 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 dependencies. So it means that all these dependencies have to be discovered and they have to be entered into that that this that matrix which which produces the distance function. So how can we implement the color? Uh, the algorithm that I've shown is basically a very naive algorithm because it just loops through all, all events every time. So it starts in every pass, it starts from zero. And of course, if you want performance, it should be like incremental. So somehow it is notified about changes in the future event set and, and, and uh, does the, it only does incremental processing. And there's another thing, which is might be a little bit subtle that we can look into here, it's here, that uh, in the work, the worker thread, which does the simulation, works in the following day. First, it removes, removes the message from the future event set, and then it gives it to the module, into the handle message function, and the handle message function can do whatever. So it deletes the message, it sends the message, and schedules it or schedules other messages and so on. And all this takes time. But the thing is that the color for the color, uh, this has to be this has to happen atomically. So removing an event and adding the the events that it caused has to happen atomically because this is the only way the algorithm can work. So this looks like um, a contradiction, but uh, it can be resolved by by letting the color work on a view on the future event set. So it should not look directly on the future event set. It should look at some kind of modified view of the future event set where uh, the events that are being currently processed still look like they would be inside the future event set. Okay, um, let's look at the scheduling of worker threads. So, of course, that would be easy if um, the number of green events would be exactly the same as the number of cores all the time, because then each thread would pick like one, one event, and and that's that's it. But uh, um, that's not always the case. Okay, first we can make an observation that if if a worker thread grabs more than one event at a time, then it may reduce the dropping overhead, so it can can result in in more more efficient execution. The other other thing is that if you have uh, many more events, then uh, how should the course proceed? How should worker threads proceed? So in which order should they serve them? Because the order the, uh, the these events are processed can affect performance. So for example, it would make sense to to assign events that are supposedly going to take a short time you would group them and give them to one worker thread while if you have an event that's supposedly going to take a long time to do they would have they would be assigned to a to, to a, a um a work, to a worker thread to their own worker thread Yes, and of course, 
these are just very superficial observations. So I think one can do a lot of, lot of stuff here. So like, I don't know, measure the times of events, measure the times, various types of events take and, and take statistics and, and based on those statistics, we can make speculative execution somehow. It's like, um, like jump prediction in, in, in CPUs. So uh, it can affect the performance quite well. So now we come to the second problem of concurrent access because instead of a sequential program, we now have a multi-core, a multi-multi-threaded program, which everyone knows that. Welcome to the to the world of uh, mutexes and semaphores and locks and all kind of stuff. So of course the the future event set is under heavy concurrent access. So it either has to be locked, but we know that um, locking can be quite, um, can have quite a lot of overhead. So nowadays, um, people are looking at log-free data structure to, to reduce this overhead. And I've seen papers about like log-free calendar queues for parallel simulation. So there is some kind, some, some research that uh, one, can, one can build upon. And um, the second one is that, of course, the simulation model and the state, which means like the variables inside the modules, they are also concurrently accessed now. So, uh, so if you make cross-module method calls, then these need to be protect protected. But the situation is not is not as not as bad as it looks because if you have a compound module where which forms where all the submodules form a zero zero delay group, there will no there will be no concurrent events processed in there because because we have seen why not, and then those internal internal accesses don't need to be protected, which means like practically it means that in an INET host or INET router, if you make a method call, for example, from the IP module to the routing table, it doesn't need to be protected because these modules form a zero delay group and, and there will be no concurrent events. Uh, yeah, sim signal, simulation signals, they, they can cause a problem because uh, now listeners can be invoked concurrently by, by from multiple events that emit signals. So they have probably have to be, have to be protected. Um, yeah, so it's altogether it means that the model code needs needs to be instrumented a little for zero config parsing. Um, uh, this this uh, additional code that needs to be done it doesn't look insurmountable. I mean, it, it, it's it's probably quite a manageable task. Okay, it's about simulation kind of infrastructure. So. So if the model is static, then the simulation kernel and its the infrastructure doesn't need much protection. Uh, the thing that could make those problems is dynamic module creation and, and other changes inside the model. And well, if we look at like result recording, that means that result filters and result recorders can now also be uh, invoked in concurrently from different events via emit calls and this means that they also have to be protected and of course writing into the result files have to be have to be protected as well otherwise we get corrupt files yeah so we run a small experiment in inet and we asked the question that whether there are enough green events in in simple simulations in normal everyday simulations to make this worthwhile because if if there is a study, if some study shows that there is only one or two green events all the time, it doesn't make sense for the whole thing to run. But it looks like it's not not the similar. The situation is quite good. So we run a small simulation. It had uh, four local area networks and four hosts in each local area network. And when we run this simulation, there were four or five green events. And uh, it's expected if you run larger simulations, there will be more and more green events. And altogether, you don't really need a high number of green events because like, okay, if you have 16 cores, you can use at most probably like 15 
uh, 15 read events at a time because you can't process more events than that concurrently. So <coughs> it, it looks actually quite promising. Andras, if you yeah. wrap up. Yeah. So. Good timing. Because this is this is the summary slide now. So if someone's uh, thinking about doing this kind of research, then what can you publish about? So there's some things like that. the choice of the future events and data structure, like log-free data structure and so on. Efficient coloring algorithm. This is this is Mm -hmm. so there are a lot of lot of uh, degrees of freedom here, and also work with that scheduling. And uh, I should say that uh, this idea is quite novel, so I haven't seen many papers that, or or actually there are no, as far as I know, there are no simulators like generic purpose simulation frameworks which do this kind of parallel simulation or provide usable, scalable parallel simulation support. So. We come to our last slide. So if you're interested, please contact us. Thank you.